Hey, Cody. Oh, man. Yeah, it's Cody. All right. <laughs> okay, well, good morning, everybody. Good to see everybody out. Right and early. Where's Suzanne? <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Check on everybody. <laughs> All right. Yeah, that's right. Okay, let's pray. Father, we come to you now because you're not only our Father, Lord, you're our teacher. And we're all here waiting to hear what you will speak to us this morning. So speak, Lord. Your servants are hearing. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Turn your Bibles. We're going to cover a section here in Matthew 21, which is uh, one of the several uh, sections where the Lord Jesus is challenged in uh, Acts, uh, I mean, in, in Matthew 21, 23, Matthew 21, 23 through 27 is a portion for this morning. So please follow along as I read that. And when he was come into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, by what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? And Jesus answered and said unto them, I also will ask you one thing, which if ye tell me, I in like wise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John. Whence was it, from heaven or of men? And they reasoned with themselves, saying, If you should say from heaven, he will say unto us, Why did you not then believe him? But if we shall say of men, we fear the people, for all hold John as a prophet. And they answered Jesus and said, We cannot tell. And he said unto them, Neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. Now, verse 23 tells us that Jesus went right into the temple that morning. As a matter of, but, but what's interesting here is that we know from the a verse above there, from verse 18, he was hungry. He was hungry that morning. And we know that when he was hungry in verse 18, that he had come to a fig tree, and he was hoping to, to find some figs, but he did not. So, when he comes into the temple, he's still hungry. And what's interesting here is that in his state of hunger when he was looking so much for those figs to eat, that when in that state of hunger, he did not put eating as a higher priority over the people that, in other words, it doesn't say, it doesn't say, I'm hungry, he didn't say, it doesn't say that he said, I'm hungry, I need to eat first, eat first, and then I'm going to go teach the people. That's not what he did. That's not what he did. He was still hungry, but teaching the people was more important to him than eating. Like Job, who said that the word of God was more important to him than food itself in Job 23, 12. Job 23, 12. Job said, neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. See, Job said that he valued, he esteemed, he rated the word of God higher than food. He did, and Job did not call, it's interesting what Job called the, the, the Word of God, we, we, the Bible. Job did not call the Bible the, 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 uh, uh, the, uh, the Word of God. He didn't call, the, he, 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 he didn't call it at this point the Word of God. He called it the words of his mouth. The words of his mouth. That shows how, how closely Job saw the link between the Word of God and God Himself. And to call the Bible, if we were to, to for us to, to call the Bible the words of His mouth, which is what Job called this book, it shows how, how closely Job has, 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 has seen, has seen uh, the, the Bible to God. God. Job saw the Bible as close to God as Moses saw the Bible when Moses wrote in Deuteronomy 8.3, Deuteronomy 8.3, that uh, God humbled thee 
and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knowest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord, doth man live. So when Job calls the Bible the words of his mouth, and Moses calls the Bible the words that proceed out of the mouth of the Lord, Job and Moses are not saying that the Bible came from the hands of God as a book that is passed from God's hands to our hands. Job and Moses are saying that the Bible was from the very mouth of God, and in fact, Job was very specific about what part of the mouth that, 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 that the Bible comes from, from God, when he says in Job 23, 12, Job 23, 12, he says, the commandment of his lips, he says his lips, the Bible does, is, is not portrayed here, is coming from the hands of God, oh no, the Bible is much more personal than that, the Bible is coming from the lips of God, now, if the Bible it was portrayed here as coming from the hands of God, then God, then, then the picture is that God handed the Bible to us, he hands the Bible to us, and we would see ourselves in a symbolic sense as reaching out our hand to receive the Bible from God's hand. And you receive many things with your hands. You shake hands with people, and people give you things into your hands, and that's taking from their hand to your hand. But Job and Moses are not painting this picture for us of the hand, of a transfer by hands. Job and Moses are, are talking about receiving from the lips of God the Bible as their life, as Moses, put, uh, Job put it, as Job put it in Job 23, 12, more than my necessary food, as Moses put it in Deuteronomy 8, 3, Deuteronomy 8, 3, man does not live by bread only, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. So when both Job and Moses are talking about receiving the Bible from the mouth of God, from the lips of God, so that man could live, they're not talking about, as is so commonly said, from God's mouth to man's ears. They're not talking about man receiving in his ears the Bible from God's mouth, because when Job and Moses are talking about the Bible being life and coming from God's mouth, they are referring back to what happened to man when man got life originally, which was in Genesis 2-7, Genesis 2-7, where it says, And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils, the breath of life, and man became a living soul. That was God's mouth. That was God's lips breathing into man. If I had said to my wife, I have something I want to communicate to you, and the only way I can communicate to you is with my lips, she would know she was going to get a big kiss. <laughs> and when Job and Mo Moses talk about the Bible as being the Genesis 2-7, life from the lips of God. They're saying to us that the Bible is the kiss of God. In Genesis 2-7, God kissed life into man. In Job 23-12 and Deuteronomy 8-3, through the Bible, God kisses life into man. Now, we've all heard the term, the kiss of death. The kiss of death. Where did that come from? The kiss of death. Well, the kiss of, the kiss of death refers back to Judas. Judas Iscariot, when he kissed Christ into death by the betrayal, that kiss that was the kiss of Judas in Luke 22, 47. Luke 22, 47, where it says, And while he yet spake, behold, a multitude, and he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near unto Jesus, to kiss him. But Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? See, the kiss of Judas was the classic kiss of death because from that encounter with Judas, where that encounter was a kiss, 
death followed for Christ. What God gave to man in Genesis 2-7 was the kiss of life. We call it a kiss of life because from, what, from that encounter, which was in the form of a kiss, life followed for man. What Job and Moses are telling us in, in Job 22-12 and Deuteronomy 8-3 what Job and Moses are telling us is that the Bible is God's kiss of life. This book is God's kiss of life. We can call the Bible the kiss of life because from an encounter with the Bible, life follows. As, 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 um, as Peter tells us in 1 Peter 1.23, 1 Peter 1.23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So just as new life comes from being born, so new life comes from being born again. And when we sit down with the Bible, a good prayer for us can be, I open up this board, this, this book, Lord, kiss me. Kiss me with your kiss of life. What would it be like if we were to put on the cover of our Bible, The Kiss of Life? And, and under that title, of Kiss of Life, you put Deuteronomy 8.3, Deuteronomy 8.3. Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. And you put under that title for your Bible, Kiss of Life, Deut Job 23.12, Job 23.12, the commandments of his lips. What would it be like? If you started to call the Bible the kiss of life, what would it be like if when you left your house today to come to church, you said, wait a minute, I, I have to get my kiss of life. And you meant you're going to go get your Bible. What would it be like if I said to you this morning, please open your kiss of life to John 3.16? I think I'll do that. <laughs> anyway, we should be doing that just for a day, just, to, just for a day. Call the Bible the kiss of life. And see how calling the Bible the kiss of life changes our view of the Bible as seeing the Bible is our life coming from the lips of God. So when Moses said in Deuteronomy 8.3, Deuteronomy 8.3, he says, Man doth not live by bread only, but, every, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God doth man live. The Hebrew word for mouth is pe. Pe. That's the Hebrew word for mouth. It comes from a Hebrew root, pa'a, pa'a. Pa'a means to blow. It means to blow. It's, it, 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 so, so the mouth in Hebrew as, is seen as blowing out breath. That's how it's pictured in Hebrew. And so the picture of the Bible is God blowing out into man his breath, his breath of life. The fact that Genesis 2-7 says, Genesis 2-7 the Lord breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. The Hebrew word for breath there, breath, is neshama, neshama, which means a puff. It means a puff. And that's why the Bible is called in 2 Timothy 3.16, 2 Timothy 3.16, it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God. The Greek word, they're used for inspiration is nustos. It's theo nustos, the inspiration from God. But the, the word inspiration, inspiration is nustos, from which we get our, our word pneumatic. Pneumatic, as in a pneumatic hammer, a pneumatic drill, meaning that it's driven by air, driven by air. So what what 2 Timothy 3.16 is saying is that all scripture is by inspiration of God. It means that all scripture is driven by God's breath. It's driven by the breath from his lips. Which again tells us that the Bible is, the, is God's kiss of life. So in verse 23, we see that, 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 that Christ is now in the, in, 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 in the temple. He's in the temple now. And... He's hungry, he's in the temple, but, but, but the word of God is more important to him than food. So he's teaching, he's teaching in the temple. And Christ had said already in verse 13 above, he said, uh, it's written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. Prayer, he said. But what he's doing here is not praying, 
He's teaching. So from his teaching in the temple, we see that the temple was both a place of prayer and a place of teaching. Both teaching and prayer are the lifeblood of a church. That's the lifeblood of a church. The church, and, 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 and in the church, teaching should not crowd out prayer. And in a church, prayer should not crowd out teaching. Because teaching and prayer are both the lifeblood of a church. And that's what the apostles said that they were going to give themselves to in Acts 6.4. Acts 6.4. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The ministry of the word is teaching and preaching. You know, Billy Graham, at his crusades, he would stand in the pulpit and he would teach and he would preach and he would give his message. And then he would, and then at the end, he would invite the people to, to get up out of their seats and to come forward to the pulpit to receive Christ. And then he, and then he would not sit down, which most people did. He would not sit down. The classic picture of Billy Graham was of him remaining in the pulpit like this, or like this, however he did it, you know, with his hands clasped and praying. And the temple was for teaching and prayer, and the church is for teaching and prayer. And when in the future, the temple in Jerusalem is going to be rebuilt, which it will be, and Jerusalem will become the capital of the world, then all the people of the world will come as tourists to Jerusalem. And when they do that, when they will do that, they will be saying the words of Isaiah 2.3, Isaiah 2.3. This will be the time of the fulfillment of Isaiah 2.3, where it says, <coughs> And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. That's the mountain that Jerusalem is built on. It's called Zion. The mountain of the Lord. To the house of the God of Jacob. That's the temple. And he will teach us of his ways. And we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So when that happened, when that, that prophecy happens in Isaiah 2.3... Tourists will not be coming to Israel because Tel Aviv is the gay capital of the world. When Isaiah 2-3 happens, tourists will not be coming to Israel to see the ancient sites of the Bible. When, when that happens, tourists will be coming to Israel, to Jerusalem, for what they are not coming there today for. When Isaiah 2-3 happens, from, tourists from all over the world will be coming to Israel to the temple in Jerusalem so that they can change their lives, so that they can walk with God. When Isaiah 2-3 happens, tourists from all over the world will be coming to the temple in Jerusalem to be taught. They'll be coming to receive teaching, to learn who is Jesus Christ as God, to learn what is the will of God for my life, to learn how can I change my life to walk with God. To learn, how can I repent of my sins so that I can draw closer to God? That will be the drawing card for all the people of the world to come as tourists to Jerusalem. And they'll learn all of that in the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. So that the scene we see here now in verse 23, where it says in verse 23, He was coming to the temple, He was teaching. That's just a little scene of what it's a little foretaste of what Jerusalem, of what the temple, rebuilt temple, is going to be in Isaiah 2, 3 when it happens. Jerusalem will become the place that it is talked about in Psalm 48, Psalm 48, 1 through 10, where it says in Psalm 48, 1 through 10, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of His holiness. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. But before that happens, before that happens, where we are right now, it's a hold on to your hat 
time. Because Jerusalem, before Jerusalem becomes the Psalm 48-2, joy of the whole earth, we are in store for Jerusalem to become the exact opposite. Uh, for Jerusalem to become the Zechariah 12-2 Jerusalem. Zechariah 12-2, which says, Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling fear, terror, a cup of trembling unto all the people round about, when they shall be in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And in that day, I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the earth, people of the earth be gathered together against it. So before Jerusalem becomes uh, Psalm 48.2, the joy of the whole earth, where people will flock there to learn about God, first Jerusalem will become the Zechariah 12.2 and 3, cup of trembling unto all people, and burdensome stone unto all people. Okay, now, <clears throat> uh, we are in uh, verse 23 here. And the start of this statement in verse 23, it looks so good. I mean, if you just kind of dream on a little bit, daydream, and sort of cut the sentence where it says, and when he was come into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching. If you just, and said, and you just cut it there, just cut it there. If you just stop that sentence right there, with the, right where it says said, and if we just kind of write it the way we would like it to sound, we would, we, 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 if we could just write the rest of the history ourselves, what would we write? I mean, it, we, I mean, when he was coming to the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him, and, and, and if only we could just write that they said the words of John 1.45, if, if only we could just, if this could be the way it was, where, where they came into the temple and they said, John 145, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write. If only it could, could have said like that. If only it could have said, they came unto him as he was teaching and they said, we have found you, the Genesis 315 seed of the woman that's going to crush the head of the serpent, the Satan. If only they could have said, if only it could have write, be written and it said, they came unto him as he was teaching and said, we have found you, the Genesis 49.10, Shiloh, to whom all the people of God are going to gather around. Just could have said that. If it just could have said, we, they came unto him as he was teaching and they said, we found you, the Isaiah 7.14, Emmanuel, born of a virgin. If it could have said that, if it could have said we, they came unto him as he was teaching and they said, we found you the Isaiah 9-6, child born, son given, whose name is the mighty God. If it could, just could have been written where it says they came unto him as he was teaching and they said, we found you the Isaiah 53, righteous servant, who will be wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities, who will heal us with your wounds, and, and, and who the Lord is going to lay on you, the iniquity of us all. If it just could have read like that, if it just could have read like, they came unto him as a teaching, and they said, we found you the Micah 5, 2, eternal ruler of Israel that's born in Bethlehem. If it just could have said something like, we found him, as it was, it was teaching, and they said, we found him, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Any of those things, the history would have been so different if the ones who should have said those things, <clears throat> because they were the chief priests, they were the elders of the people, the people were relying on them to tell them, He is the Messiah, He is God. If, if, if they just would have done any of those we found you statements. Or if it would have been like, like if they all came like Nicodemus came. And what if the record had centered just on them so that the, the chief priests and the elders weren't necessarily telling other people, but they were just speaking personally about themselves and they came to him with their own sense of their need. 
and it was said something like, how about if we could write it and it said something like, they came unto him as he was teaching, and they said, John 3, 2, John 3, 2, when Nicodemus says, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles as thou doest except God be with him. That's what Nicodemus said. Or what if they came to him, and we could rewrite it, and it said, they came to him as he was teaching, and they said the words of Acts 16.30, Acts 16.30, Sir, what must I do to be saved? As a, as, a Philippi, as, a, as, a, as a Philippian jailer said. What if we could rewrite it, and it, and it wrote, they came to him as he was teaching, and they said, John 20.28, 20, John 20.28, 20, My Lord and my God, as Thomas did say to him. How about if we could rewrite it and it, and it would read, they came unto him and he, as he was teaching and they said, Mark 124, Mark 124, I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God, as a devil said to him. How about if we could rewrite it and it said, it said they, they, they came unto him as he was teaching and they said the words of Mark 924, Mark 924, Lord I believe, Help thou mine unbelief, as a trembling father of a sick son said. How about if you could rewrite it, and it said, came unto him as he was teaching, and he said the words of Mark 2.11, Mark 2.11, they fell down and worshipped him, and when they had opened their gifts, they presented him to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, as wise men did. How about if we could rewrite it, and it said, they came unto him as he was teaching, and said, Matthew, 8-2, Matthew 8-2, they worshipped him saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean, as one leper did when he said that to him. How about if we could rewrite it and it said something like, come unto him, they came unto him as he was teaching and said, Matthew 9-27, Matthew 9-27, thou son of David, have mercy on us, as two blind men had said to him in the past. How about if we could rewrite it and it said, they came unto him as he was teaching and said, Luke 23, 42, Luke 23, 42, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. As a thief said, when that thief was dying on a cross next to him. How about we could rewrite it and it said, they came unto him as he was teaching and they said, Luke 19, 8, Luke 19, 8, behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from a man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. As a tax collector named Zacchaeus said to him. How about if we could rewrite it and it said, they came unto him as he was teaching and he said, Job 42.6, Job 42.6, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes, as Job said. Or how about if we could rewrite it and it said, they came unto him as he was teaching and they said, Luke 5.8, Luke 5.8, falling down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord, as Simon Peter said to him. Or if we could just rewrite it from the very words of this chapter, and, and it read, came, they came unto him as he was teaching, and they said the words of verse 15, verse 15, Hosanna to the son of David, as the children were saying to him at that, the day before in the temple. Or how about if we could rewrite it and it would say something like, they came to me as he was teaching and said, Job 10.8, Job 10.8, thine hands have made me and fashioned me. That's what Job said to him. That's what Job said. Well, he was daydreaming. He was daydreaming. He was dreaming. It didn't happen that way. Verse 23 is written totally differently. We want it to be read that way, but it's not. And all those statements were true. They were 100% true. And all those statements are what they should have said to him. But they did not say any of those things, and that was the tragedy. And instead, we have to sadly read what they actually did say and what the verse does read, which is, verse 23, verse 23, when he was come into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, by what authority doest thou these things, and who gave thee this authority? They didn't come to him as he was teaching in the temple, falling down before him, worshiping him, confessing their sins to him, repenting before him, begging for him to have mercy. They didn't do any of that. 
They didn't come to him being the elders of the people. They should have been telling the people that he was the Messiah, that he was God in the flesh, he was the Savior. Instead, they came, as he was teaching, challenging his authority. Just the opposite of what they should have done and said. So when we see verse 23, we're reminded again that from the time of his birth, Jesus Christ was opposed. Whether it was whether he was as a baby being 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 opposed by a wild King Herod who ordered all the babies in Bethlehem to be murdered in an effort to kill him, or whether as a 12-year-old when he was in the temple challenging the doctors of the law with questions in Luke 246, Luke 246, when it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. Or later, when he was accused by the religious leaders of being in league with Satan in Matthew 12, 24, Matthew 12, 24, when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow doth not cast out devils, but by the ails above the prince of the devils. So now, with just a few days for him to live before he's murdered, he's opposed in the temple by the religious leaders who are seen here challenging his authority. And Jesus said that to follow him is to be hated by the world. And it was not easy for Christ to have to maneuver in a world that hated him. And it's not easy for any of his followers to maneuver in a world to bring the word of Christ to a world that hates Christ. And all this hatred and all this strife and all this contention, sometimes it can really get to you. And it really got to Jeremiah. It really got to the prophet Jeremiah, who complained to his mother in Jeremiah 15.10, Jeremiah 15.10, where Jeremiah said, Woe is me, my mother, that thou hast borne a man of strife and a man of contention to the whole world. I have neither lent on usury nor men have lent to me on usury, yet every one of them doth curse me. Jeremiah lived in a very sinful time in Israel's history, and therefore Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 15.10 that he was a man of strife and a man of contention to the whole earth, and that every one of, the, every, every, every one of them doth curse me. And we would say to Jeremiah, yes, Jeremiah, everyone curses you, Jeremiah, except for one, and that's God. Everyone curses Jeremiah, but God blesses Jeremiah. And what would you rather have, to be blessed by the world and cursed by God, or to be cursed by the world and blessed by God? That's what's on the line. Well, here is now Jesus in this chapter, and he is being cursed by the chief priests and the elders. And these are the two groups here. The, the chief priests and the elders are two, groups of, uh, are two groups of the actual judges. They're actual judges in the two types of court that there were in Israel. There were two types of court. One court was for um, uh, religious ecclesiastical. It was for trying cases of blasphemy against God. Those were the chief priests who were the judges in that court. And there was another court which was for trying civil matters, and thus was the elders of the people who were the judges in the civil court. But both those two groups of judges for those two types of courts have now joined together to oppose and challenge Jesus in verse 23. And, and, and they don't wait until he's finished teaching. They don't wait till they might till he might take questions, which I never do, but anyway, they never do. Right in the middle of his teaching, they interrupt him. They were, there were people in the temple who wanted to hear him. They were glued to what the Lord was teaching. They'd never heard anything like this before. He was so different from the other teachers. There was never a teacher like him. Matthew 7, 28, Matthew 12, 28. It came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. He taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes. The chief priests and the elders knew that his authority was what astonished the people, and that's why they attacked his authority in verse, 20, in verse 23 here. At one point in the past, the Pharisees had sent officers to arrest Jesus and to bring him to him for questioning. And they, the officers, when they went there, they were so captivated by what Jesus was saying that they returned and they said, we never heard anyone like this before. 
in, in, in John 7, 45, John 7, 45. Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto him, Why have you not brought him? The officers said, Never a man spake like this man. And they answered the Pharisees, Are you also deceived? When Jesus spoke, there was a distinctive assurance. There was a boldness that he had that, 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 that where there was no tinge of uncertainty about what he said. Like Pastor Jim used to always say, no doubt about it. He used to say that, no doubt about it. John 7, 25, John 7, 20. Then sent some of them to Jerusalem. This is not this he whom they seek to kill. But lo, he speaketh boldly. They say nothing to him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ? Luke 1947, Luke 1947, he taught daily in the temple, but the chief priests and scribes, the chief of the people, sought to destroy him and could not what they might do, for all the people were very attentive to hear him. That Greek word there for attentive to hear him is the word hung, hung. It means they hung on every word that Christ spoke. And the fact that they interrupted him in the middle of his teaching, it shows the chief priests and, and, and we're interested in blocking the people from hearing him as he taught. This is what he said to the lawyers. To so the lawyers, he said in Matthew 23, 13, Matthew 23, 13, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, or rather to the scribes and Pharisees, sir. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. You neither go in yourself, neither suffer you them that are entering to go in. Christ is the only way to heaven and when they stopped him from teaching, they were stopping others from entering into heaven. This is what he said to the lawyers. The lawyers in Luke 11, 52. Luke 11, 52. Woe unto you, lawyers. You've taken away the key of knowledge. You entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering you hindered. The key of knowledge, he said. And Christ is said to be, in Colossians 2, 3, Colossians 2, 3, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Christ is the key of knowledge. Christ is a hidden treasure. Jesus Christ is a hidden treasure. For most people, they look at Jesus Christ, and they don't see any treasures that are hidden in him because they're hidden. They just see a religious figure like other religious figures. For most people, they look at Jesus Christ, they see a crucifix in a church. And they're turned off. But Jesus Christ is a hidden treasure because in Jesus Christ are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. That means that Jesus Christ is the key of knowledge and when his enemies were interrupting him from teaching and silencing him, which they finally did when they murdered him, in taking him away, they were taking away the key of knowledge from the people. Christ was interrupted right in the middle of his teaching. I know how it feels. Because... Uh, about 50 years ago, when I came to this church, more than that, November 1970, when Don Ailes picked up my wife and I up in a Volkswagen van with their three little kids in sleeping bags that looked like animals. <laughs> and they picked me up. They picked us up for a Sunday evening service. And I was only two months old in the Lord. I was just a new believer in Christ. And after coming here for a little while, Pastor Jim said to me, you're Jewish, you don't know the Bible. And I said, that's right. And he said, well, you're the new Sunday school teacher. <laughs> that's how I became a Bible teacher. <laughs> and not, not long after that, when I was teaching Sunday school, right here, just where I'm standing right now, there was a man sitting right where Paul sitting, that last pew back there. And right in the middle, that man as I was teaching, interrupted and started challenging me and saying, that's not true, that's not true. That man was my father. That was the only time he ever came to church. So Christ was interrupted as he was teaching, and it wasn't over what he was teaching. It wasn't over the content. No one came to Christ and said, what, are you, what you're teaching is not true. No one came to Christ and saying, your teaching is not in line with the scriptures. It was all a matter of authority. He was teaching, he was challenged over. Their, ch their question was, who? who gave you this authority to teach? And they had asked, if, they were asking, do you have a license to teach? Show it to us. Did Caesar give you that authority to teach? 
Did one of the chief priests give you that authority to teach? Did the high priest give you the authority to teach? Did God give you the authority to teach? As if uh, they were actually asking, as they had said in the past, or did Satan give you that authority to teach? And this is what they were challenging Christ over. And this is what they were interrupting his teaching to ask him that question. Clearly, their intention was to stop him from teaching, just as it was when I was challenged about 50 years ago in the back of this church. Well, in case you haven't noticed, it didn't stop me. <laughs> <laughs> and the question of, about authority didn't stop Christ either from teaching, just to when they, they asked him that question. That, that. Now, if we just take one step back on this scene, from the drama of it all, and, and, and just look objectively and kind of look at it on the surface, they, they actually asked him a question that's a very good question for us to ask ourselves. When we speak to someone about Jesus Christ, by what authority do we have the right to barge in on someone's life with the message that if they don't receive Christ as their Savior, that they're going to land in hell? I sat next to a man yesterday on the plane, a, 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 a young man, from Indonesia. Never heard about Christ before. He was from Indonesia. What authority did I have to, to bring the message to him? And second, who gives us this authority? I mean, the Bible says that there are those who preach and teach, and they don't have authority. It says in Jeremiah 23, 21, Jeremiah 23, 21, I've not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I've not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words, then they should have turned them from their evil way, from the evil of their doings. God stood amazed at this time that there were those with so much confidence, so much boldness, so much assurance, without one drop of doubt, and God said about those preachers and teachers in Jeremiah 23, 31, I've not sent those prophets, but they ran. I've not spoken to them, but they prophesied. It's like God saying, how can they have such chutzpah to teach and to preach the Bible, they say, when I didn't send them? And that brings us a question. How are we to know if God has sent a teacher and if God has spoken to that teacher and that teacher speaks for God? How are we to know that? When we hear a preacher or a teacher, how are we to know if he speaks for God? Because, and, and the answer is, God said in Jeremiah 23, 32, Jeremiah 23, 32, if they had stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words, then should that turn them from their evil way, the people, and from the evil of their doings. We can know by asking simple questions about a teacher or a preacher. And the first question is, is the direction of his teaching away from sin and towards holiness? Or is the direction of the teacher flattering the people with a message that man is essentially good inside and does not need to be sensitive to his sin to stomp it out? The second question, is the teacher showing the people how to repent and how to live a life that pleases God? Or is the teaching telling the people that they're really so good inside that all they have to do is learn how to, to turn themselves inside out and all that goodness will come out? Is the teacher saying that God is good and man is bad and therefore man needs God as a savior so he can get him to heaven? Or is their teacher saying that man is good, he's good enough to be able to work his way into heaven. It, this is what God means when he says that a true teacher with authority from God is 2332, 2332, should have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. A true teacher with authority from God will teach that man has a hell-deserving sin problem and that man needs Christ too. 1 Corinthians 15, 3, 1 Corinthians 15, 3, Christ died for our sins. A true teacher with authority from God will teach man, to teach man that he desperately needs Christ because, <clears throat> Romans 3, 23, Romans 3, 23, all of sin and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23, Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, 
Revelation 20.14. Revelation 20.14. Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The true teacher with authority from God will teach that man is separated from God. Separated from God. Not God is my friend and I talk to him every day. But he is separated from God and needs to be reconciled to God by the blood of Christ. Because Isaiah 59.2, Isaiah 59.2, your iniquities have separated between you and your God. And your sins have hid his face from him so that he will not hear. Romans 5.9, Romans 5.9. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. A true teacher will teach the need for reconciliation with God. A true teacher will show the way, God's way, of reconciliation with God. And he'll know that he has authority from God to teach us reconciliation because of 2 Corinthians 5.17. 2 Corinthians 5.17. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ that be reconciled to God, for he hath made him to be sin for us, and you know sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. It's all about reconciliation, because two parties are at odds. Two parties are at enemies with each other. Two parties are at war with each other. There needs to be peace in the valley. And Jesus Christ brings peace in the valley between the two mountains of defiant parties, God and man. That's the Bible's message. And that's how you know. A true teacher will teach the need for reconciliation with God and the way of reconciliation with God. And the authority from God is necessary to teach and preach, because Romans 10, 13, Romans 10, 13 says, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they not believe? How then they shall believe in him in whom they not heard? How then shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach except they be sent? The authority to preach comes from being sent. Romans 10, 15, Romans 10, 15, How shall they preach unless they are sent? And the ultimate teacher was from God was Jesus Christ. As Nicodemus said in, Nic in, in John 3, 2, John 3, 2, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. So Christ has been challenged with this question of by what authority he teaches and who gave him the authority. And the opponents now with this question, they made a move on the chessboard of life. And, and his opponents have calculated that now they've got them trapped, and their expectation is that either Christ will not give them an answer in which they'll say, his silence is proof, he does not have authority to teach, or he'll say that his authority has come from God, in which case they will demand that he perform a miracle to prove it, and that will show the people that Christ listens to us and he does what we tell him to do when we ask for this. Therefore, we are superior to Jesus. So the stage is set. It's tense. Very tense. Because the opponents think we've got him now with this question on the chessboard of life. They tried to trap him. They tried to catch him in the past. Luke 4, 28, Luke 4, 28. All day in the synagogue when they heard these things were filled with wrath. And they rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him into the brow of the hill whereon their city was built that they might cast him down headlong. But he... Passing through the midst of them went his way. And now comes again with their questions. The rising up and the hope to destroy him. And again will come. He passing through the midst of them goes his way. He'll continue teaching. He will again slip out of their hands. And he does it with such an admirable, elegant, uh, another question. And a promise. He 
says in verse 24, verse 24, Jesus answered and said unto them, I also will ask you one thing, which you tell, which if you tell me, I in likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. He's made his move on the chessboard of life by saying, are you asking me questions? Are we, in the, are we asking questions? Is that your move on the chessboard? Well then, to ask me a question? Okay, then I'll also ask you one thing, and I promise you that if you answer me one simple question, I'll answer your question. And he does that. And he says, the question about John the Baptist. Was he from God or not? With that one question, we can hear the opponent say, John the Baptist? Who said anything about John the Baptist? And they don't know what to say. And so they retreat back for a powwow in verse 25. They reason with themselves, verse 25, saying, if we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, why did you not believe him? And they go on and say, if we say from men, everybody holds him as a prophet, we're in trouble with the people. So with that one question, the enemies of Christ have been thrown into a state of total confusion. Confusion. It's like the prayer of the psalmist is answered in Psalm 70, verse 2. Psalm 70, verse 2. Let them be ashamed and confounded that seek after my soul. Let them be turned backwards and put to confusion that desire my hurt. And that's what happened. That one question, they know that they've met their match with the one who is Matthew 12, 42. Matthew 12, 42. Behold, a greater than Solomon is here. They don't know what to say. Because if they say he was from God, then they know that Christ's next move on the chessboard is going to be, well, why didn't you endorse him? Why didn't you follow him? Why weren't you lined up with those ones who are coming from all Judah and, and, and Jerusalem, confessing their sins to God? And, and then if they, they know if they say, well, if we say he's not from God, then they know that his next move is, 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 is going to be, so you don't believe that John was, then the move is going to come from the people who are going to turn against them. So in a bind, in confusion, they confess they can't answer the question. They just get, which really they're saying, we won't answer the question. They won't answer the question. And then Christ tells them, I won't answer your question. And that's how, with one elegant question, how he silenced the voice of his enemies. Hallelujah, what a Savior, what a, what a great man, great, great, great God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for our admirable Christ. And as we see him here, Lord, the lamb in the midst of lions, Lord, and you gave him the wisdom, but he conducted himself so admirably, Lord. And uh, all we want to say is we want to be like Jesus.